uh, first of the year 2018, my father-in-law got uh, diagnosed with um, lung cancer. And uh, sorry, <laughs> um, of course, Jacqueline uh, came straight to the prayer clinic, and um, it wasn't until uh, shortly after, uh, you know, things kind of went south for my father-in-law. He went in for a uh, routine procedure in February, and um, the doctor uh, messed up in uh, a routine procedure and caused him to have a thoracic spinal stroke, paralyzing him from the chest down. It wasn't until that point that I joined in with her, not that I was apprehensive by any means, but um, desperation set in. When I first got to the prayer clinic, I didn't feel like there was any hope for any of the situations that we were going through. We had four kids under seven at this point. I was literally just grasping for any type of hope I could possibly receive. Um, and the prayer clinic gave me that. Words can't express our gratitude. Yes. They, uh, These people intercede where we fall short. I feel like sometimes my prayers don't reach <laughs> and these are intercessory prayer warriors and they help guide you through these dark and difficult times and through such trial and tribulation has come so much peace and understanding and it's not about us it's just about the journey um, but to have the prayer warriors on your side yes to know that um, even if we don't show up for a weekend and we're not present they're praying for they're us. praying for us and our family um, is just very very comforting uh, just a couple weeks ago we weren't here and our son was sick in the hospital and we got a text two videos of the prayer clinic mm -hmm. praying for our family and for our boy and um, so when you come into the prayer clinic, you basically just put everything on the table. Pour your heart out. Yes. <laughs> like, Be truthful and honest because there's nothing that they haven't seen or haven't heard, and they are non-judgmental. Um, and, I mean, believe me, we have our fair share of... No need to be nervous or crazy. shameful. It's... Um, they're here for love and prayer. But what they do is they pinpoint certain verses, um, and they write out a little prescription card for you. Um, which is the verse that you take home and you read and reread and read and reread all throughout the week or you know however long you need it. Ours would change up every Sunday because something else had happened. <laughs> um, but those little prescription cards are so sweet and so much powerful, so much more powerful than any type of prescription pill you could actually put in your mouth. Um, these are the words of God and um, just how much he loves us and how powerful the Bible is and how, there, how much truth there is behind that. Um, we are learning and growing every single day and the prayer clinic has helped bring all of that out in us. Um, we felt like we were treading through tepid waters and now we are on fire for God. And um, we're so thankful for that and Thompson Station Church and the prayer clinic and all of our friends and family here um, mean more to us than I can ever express. So thank you. Thank you. Good morning. It's a real honor to get to bring to a conclusion this event but hopefully you've received inspiration and edification and encouragement enough that your, your new commitment to walk as a prayer warrior with God will not end uh, when this event comes to a conclusion. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 49. We're going to look at a lot of different passages of Scripture, but this is kind of going to be a launching pad for us. And my topic, as we have followed the progression of the power of prayer, unleashing the power of prayer, is to come now to that broadest of our impact, which is unleashing the power of prayer in our world. And God certainly is all about that and is up to that. 
And if you don't have a prayer ministry going on in your church right now, I want to encourage you to really connect with what Thompson Station is doing and learn from them and allow that to be an opportunity for you to establish some kind of a prayer ministry. Just getting started, uh, they'll help you with all the tools and the resources that you'll need in order to get started. Uh, many of you might know the name of a missionary called Hudson Taylor. You've probably heard his name. You prob probably might know that in September of 1853, a little three-masted clipper slipped quietly out of the Liverpool, Liber, Liverpool Harbor with Hudson Taylor, a gaunt, wild-eyed, 21-year-old missionary aboard. He was headed for a country that was just then coming into the Christian West's consciousness. We were just then becoming aware of it. There were really at that time only a few dozen missionaries who were stationed in China. And you might know even that he spent the rest of his life there. He died 50 years later having established the China Inland Mission. And he was really instrumental, instrumentally used by God to open up the China field for missions and evangelism. Thousands have volunteered annually now to serve there, and many of these have come about on the shoulders of what Hudson Taylor did. You may also know some quotes about Hudson Taylor's life, like the one that Ruth Tucker said, and I quote, no other missionary in the 19th century since the Apostle Paul has had a wider vision and has carried out a more systematized plan of evangelizing a broad geographical area than Hudson Taylor. But what you may not know is that long before 21-year-old Hudson Taylor came off the boat in Shanghai, China on March the 1st, 1854, is that his parents, James and Amelia Hudson Taylor, had prayed that their newborn son, when he was born, would one day do the Lord's work in China. <laughs> this deeply devoted Methodist couple prayed at, when, on the day that he was born, in May of 1832, these words recorded now in history. God grant that he may work for you in China. Years later, when Hudson was a teenager, he experienced a spiritual birth during an intense time of prayer, according to his testimony. He laid stretched before God, and as he later recorded it, he said, quote, before him, with unspeakable awe and with unspeakable joy, he was converted. He spent the next years of his life in frantic preparation, learning the rudiments of medicine, studying Mandarin, and immersing himself ever deeper into the Bible and prayer. And all this resulted in the gospel penetrating what was then the deep darkness of China. Uh, we estimate now well over 100 million believers in China. Hudson invested 51 years of his life there. His first wife, Maria, died in China at the age of 33. Four of their eight children died before they reached the age of 10. Serving there in the 19th century certainly was not for sissies. Taylor told the sending missionary societies, quote, China is not to be won for Christ by quiet, ease-loving men and women. The stamp of men and women we need is such as will put Jesus, China, and souls first and foremost in everything and at every time, even life itself must be secondary. That's a pretty intense guy, isn't it? When Hudson Taylor died in June of 1905, he had established the China Inland Mission, whose missionaries would have no guaranteed salaries, nor could they appeal for funds. They would simply trust God to supply their needs as they prayed. Further, the China Inland Mission was responsible for bringing over 800 missionaries into the country of China, who began 125 schools and directly resulted in 18,000 Christian conversions, as well as the establishment of more than 300 preaching and teaching stations with more than 500 local helpers in all 18 provinces of China. And it all began when two parents at the birth of their child said, God, let this boy work for you. 
in China. Huh. Do you reckon you can make a difference in the world through your prayers? I reckon we can. You see, James and Amelia Hudson's Taylor prayer was unleashed on the world, not because of any special power in their prayer, but because of the power of the one to whom they prayed and because of the connection of their prayer to the purpose and glory of God. <laughs> Man, when we tap into the glory of God and the purpose of God, we will see God do immeasurably more than we know how to ask or even think. The Bible declares that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will, will, underline, highlight, put in bold brackets, put in a big sign on the back, of your, back wall of your house, will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord will, will, will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. It's assured to us. Do you, do you believe, the, is the Bible God's word? Did he write this book? Did he say it? Do we believe him? Well, my goodness. Then we have every assurance that when we march out of here to carry the gospel to the nations, whether that's the Syrian refugees in downtown Nashville or whether that's the refugees in Chattanooga or whether that's going to the ends of the earth in the 1040 window we have every assurance that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth we go in his name and for his glory and the one to whom we pray the one that we exalt is the one who will bring all nations to himself and the Bible declares that this glory of the Lord will cover the earth both Isaiah says this as does the more famous quote from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. Now, I wish I had time to go to the book of Revelation and talk to you a little bit about that, that the glory of God is on display in our witness. The book of Revelation teaches us about the power of our witness. I wish I had time to talk to you about the glory of God on display through our prayers as John the Apostle saw it and experienced it, the prayers of the saints wafting up like incense. Do you know that the prayers that you and I pray, they're not lost. It's not like, oh, I said that prayer, now it's done. God has collected all of our prayers. And they're continually going up as incense and offering before our God. I'm dreading the day that my mama dies. She's 98. Nobody's ever prayed for me like my mama. Probably you too, right? <laughs> but here's an assurance that I have. When she's with Jesus, probably someday soon, her prayers will still be wafting up into the presence of God. Man, that's glorious good news for us who want to carry to the ends of the earth the good news of the gospel. Look at these two verses with me in Isaiah chapter 49 let's talk about them for a couple of minutes chapter 49 verse 5 and 6 I'm reading from the New American Standard translation and now says the Lord who formed me from the womb to be his servant to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him for I am honored in the sight of the Lord and my God is my strength he says who says the Lord says that's how it started at the beginning of verse 5 the Lord says God says, and he's saying this about his son, the suffering servant. He says, it is too small a thing, too small, that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. He's not ruling them out, but he's saying, that's not all my servant's going to do. That's way too small in God's economy. I will also... Last sentence, last part of the sentence in verse 6. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. When we come to the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, whose book is often referred to as the fifth gospel, there are some specific themes in his prophetic book that are messianic. That is, they witness 
to the Lord Jesus Christ as he is revealed to us in the New Testament. For example, Isaiah talks about the branch. Isaiah talks about a stone. Isaiah talks about the light, as we just saw in verse number 6. Isaiah talks about the child that will be given, Isaiah chapter 7. He talks about a king. He talks about the suffering servant from chapter 41 almost rest to the rest of the end of the book. And 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah prophesied about the kind of suffering servant that Messiah, whom we know as and I have identified through Scripture as being the Lord Jesus Christ, what kind of suffering servant would he be? And Isaiah calls him a suffering servant who is present. For example, in chapter 41, verse 10, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not look anxiously about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. But he's not only a present God, he's a powerful God. He's a powerful suffering servant. Verse 6 and 7 of chapter 42, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I also will hold your hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. He's not only present, he's not only powerful, he's personal. In chapter 43, verses 5 and 7, do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I formed, even whom I have made. But not only is he present and powerful and personal, but he will be and was publicly humiliated. Surely our griefs he himself bore, chapter 53. And our sorrows he carried, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. And this Suffering servant is also perfectly righteous, isn't he? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus would quote these words, wouldn't he, as recorded in the Gospels, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. But in this text that we looked at in chapter 49, we also discover that God's servant, suffering servant, will be pervasive, all-encompassing. It's too small a thing that you should be my servant just to bring all Israel in. That's a good thing. And God loves his people, but God loves all people. It's too small a thing to just be one who is in tune with restoring the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And do you know when you get to the New Testament, this verse is applied, first of all, to Jesus, isn't it? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. (laughs) In the New Testament, this verse from Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, is applied to Jesus' followers. Are there any believers in the room? Okay, just a handful. (laughs) Jesus preached one of his first sermons, and he said, You are the light of the world. Don't you love how God does stuff? He appears to Moses in a burning bush. Moses, I have seen the affliction of my people. I have come to deliver them. I'm going to send you. Do what? I can't talk. They won't believe me. He's done the same thing with us. Leanne just talked about it a little bit ago. He's empowered us with his Holy Spirit. Why? Because he's seen the lostness of our world, the brokenness of our world. 
He saw it before he spoke the first star into existence, and he had a plan. Jesus isn't plan B, he's plan A. (laughs) And he knew that the son would come and lay down his life. So that he, being the light of the world, indwelling us by his spirit, would empower us to be the light of the world. (laughs) For his glory and for his namesake. So in the New Testament, if the light refers to Jesus, to Jesus' followers, and specifically to us as his ambassadors, where in Acts chapter 13, the Bible says, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, speaking to some Jews, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, and then he quotes Isaiah 49, 6, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, here's a summary statement. I'm going to give you seven things about prayer and the glory of God. It's not a seven-point sermon. I'm not going to preach every point. I want, to, I want you to hear what the Bible says. And I want us to be stirred in our hearts. I don't want us to be. God wants us to be. And I want us to be because God wants us to be stirred in our hearts to pray for the nations. Summary statement. The glory of God. The glory of God intended to be revealed in his creation shall be exalted through the faithful prayers and proclamation of the gospel by his people among all nations, all tribes, all tongues, all peoples. I'll say it one more time. The glory of God intended to be revealed in his creation but you remember sin came in the glory of god intended to be revealed in his creation which we can still see remnants of his glory in his creation can't we (laughs) but his glory shall be exalted through the faithful prayers of god's people and the faithful proclamation of his gospel to all tribes all peoples every tongue every nation his glory shall be will be friends listen to me Isaiah told us well God tells us through Isaiah and we're being reminded today it's too small a thing for us to just care about our four and no more (laughs) I hope you pray that your kids and grandkids and your neighbor's kids all get saved but here's what I hope based on what Isaiah said I hope you've got some unreached people groups on your prayer list. In November, I was in Ethiopia. It's made up of 81 tribes, 100 million people. Some of our IMB missionaries are working with a tribe called the Silte people. A million of them in that tribe. We estimate maybe at the most there's 800 believers. That's an unreached people group. Would you pray that the gospel will penetrate the Silte people? And maybe some other tribe, some other people. My wife and I were living in Qatar, you say Qatar or Qatar. Do you know that the Qatari Arabs are an unreached people group? There's 350,000 of them. You say, well, there's more people than that lives in their country. Yeah, only 10% of the people living in their country are Qatari people. Everybody else is from somewhere else. They're working, helping build their country. Would you put the Qatari people, the Qatari people on your prayer list and would you pray for them? Now let's talk just a minute about this too small a thing, if we can, in the few minutes that I have remaining. I love the way God does stuff. He coordinated uh, this message with my quiet time this morning. At 4.30, he showed me this quote. That which gives God most honor is believing. That which gives God most honor is believing. That means faith. Didn't somebody just tell us without faith, 
can't please God. Did Pastor Tom tell us that or Leanne? Somebody just said that. <laughs> so in reference to Abraham and the idea of him having a child when he is 100 years old, do you know that Paul recorded in the letter to the Romans in chapter 4, verses 18 and 20, these words, in hope against hope, this is talking about Abraham, in hope against hope, he, Abraham, believed so that he might become the father of many nations according to that which had been spoken, and then he quotes what had been spoken, recorded in the book of Genesis, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he, Abraham, contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, do you know what Paul's saying right there under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? He's saying he considered that God promised to bring a child. And he considered that his body was dead toward having a kid, being able to produce a child. And he considered that his wife's womb was all dried up. And she was done with childbearing. <laughs> but he only considered it for a minute because Paul goes on to say, without becoming weak in faith, as he considered that, with respect to the promise of God. He did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. Do you know that God has promised? We could have been there with John, right? And John, the apostle, had a vision. And in the vision, recorded in both Revelation 5 and Revelation 7, in the vision, he saw people around the throne worshiping God in eternity from every tribe and every tongue and every people and every nation. So when I go to live in the Middle East in a Muslim nation where it's illegal to evangelize, I meet Arabs and I say, hey man, do you want to get some coffee? Because in the back of my mind and in my heart, I know that some Arabs from Qatar are going to be in heaven because John already saw it. Now how good is that? That's like showing up at the UT ball game. Now, this is you really make believe right now. That's like show, showing up at the UT ball game knowing that they're going to win. <laughs> they did win a bowl game, didn't they? Well, glory to God for that. <laughs> Therefore, in our praying for the nations and in our going to the nations, we have confidence, we have faith. We believe, like Thomas Manton said, that which gives most honor to God is believing. <laughs> he will be glorified in all the earth. So, can I give you seven places from Scripture that follow the progression of His glory? Covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's what we're a part of. Every place that Thompson Station Church or your church, wherever it is that you're from, has crept into your community, which I mean you've snatched some souls out of the jaws of hell. The glory of God has invaded in that place. Every place you've carried the good news of the gospel through short-term mission teams or by sending some folks out to go live somewhere where maybe the gospel hasn't been known or where it's not far-reaching in its impact, but there have been souls that have reached. There's disciples that have been made. You have spread the glory of God across the earth in those places. And so how does the progression of that, what does it look like? Well, God created man for his glory. Let's go back to creation. That's number one. God created man for his glory. I, I read a verse a minute ago from Isaiah 43, 7. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. Isaiah is quoting God. Or how about a Romans eleven thirty six? 36? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Not only did God create man for his glory, but Moses prayed for God's glory Short verse, almost like Jesus wept. Maybe it's a verse you could memorize. I pray you, show me your glory. <laughs> I think there's a pretty good worship song out about that right now. Exodus chapter 33. How about the psalmist 
sang about his glory. <laughs> Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Psalm 29. Psalm 57. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above the earth. Psalm 66. Shout joyfully to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise Glorious. Psalm 108. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. But the prophets declared his glory, even as the psalmist sang about his glory. Isaiah chapter 66. I will set a sign among them and will send survivors from them to the nations. Tarshish, Put, Lud, Meshach, Rosh, Tubal, and Javan to the distant coastlands that have neither heard my fame nor seen my glory and they will declare my glory among the nations Isaiah 66 19 Jeremiah 33 9 it will be to me a name of joy praise and glory before all the nations of the earth which will hear of all the good that I do for them and they will fear and tremble because of all the good and all the peace that I make for them and Habakkuk 2 14 for the knowledge, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The psalmist sang about his glory. God created man for his glory. The prophets declared his glory. The angels praised his glory at Jesus' birth. <laughs> Remember the Christmas story? And suddenly there appeared with an angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest peace among men with whom he is pleased and Jesus will come in his glory <laughs> Matthew chapter 25 but when the son of man comes in his glory Jesus said and all the angels with him then he will sit on his glorious throne all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats but not only does he come in his glory but the Godhead will be glorified forever and ever in heaven revelation 7 after these things i looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne of the lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands and they cry out with a loud voice saying salvation to our god who sits on the throne and to the lamb and all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped god saying amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our god forever and ever amen Leanne reminded us earlier this morning that the sin of those who were born after Noah's flood, the descendants of Noah, are described in Genesis chapter 11 verse 4 as those who wanted to make a name for themselves. <laughs> that was never God's intent. It's not God's intent for us to make a name for ourselves. God made us for His glory and His glory alone. He is continually heard in the Old Testament telling His people, you shall know that I am the Lord, or they shall know that I am the Lord, or 33 times in Ezekiel, this phrase, they will know that I am the Lord. Friends, because the glory of God is guaranteed the knowledge of the glory of God is guaranteed to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And we have already been given a picture of what will happen in eternity when people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation are gathered around the throne of God. Therefore, He has mobilized us with confidence, believing faith to pray for Him to bring to pass what He's already assured us will come to pass. Wow. Wow. Most of the time we want to pray and know that our prayers have been answered with a yes. Do you want to really get in on that? Pick up some prayer resources that are out there in the foyer and start praying for people you don't know and can't pronounce the names of their people group. 
because they're going to be there. Some of them. And start praying for them. Say, God, I know that you will call some of those to faith in Jesus. Some of them will say yes. Some of them will say no. You're going to put your calling upon them. You're going to extend the invitation for that people group to come to know you. And I'm just going to pray in agreement with what you've already shown us and what you've already declared, that your glory will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea and that there will be believing people come from that tribe, that nation, that language, that people group. Because you see, this is exactly the assignment that was given through the Apostle Paul. You remember the, the armor passage, put on the helmet of salvation, take up the sword of the Spirit, shield of faith, gird your loins, preparation of the, your feet with the preparation of the gospel, right? Belt of truth. And then what does he say? You get all that on, what you going to do? Make a movie? You're going to get on your knees. Read Ephesians 6. He tells them, get that armor on. And then he says, and then pray. We well, yeah, the armor is good for daily life too. But by the way, in daily life, the Bible says, pray without ceasing. Paul told those Ephesian believers, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints, and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. You and I can pray with confidence. The prayer is already assured that it's going to be answered when we pray for all the peoples of the earth to hear and to believe. So here's how we're going to start our guided prayer time. Will you open your Bible or get on your phone, whatever you're using, to Psalm 96. We're going to do a little scripture praying to start this. Psalm 96. Now, if you've never, if you've never really kind of practiced scripture praying, let me, let me just give you an example whenever you get there to Psalm 96. first couple of verses say sing to the lord a new song sing to the lord all the earth sing to the lord bless his name proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day here's what i'm going to ask you to do in just a minute is to get with a partner get with somebody else and together take the words of psalm 96 and shape a prayer out of those here's how here's how verses one and two might go oh god would you fill my heart with a song to sing to you a new song a song that will go across all the earth that will bless your name, that will proclaim the good tidings of your salvation from day to day. That's how you pray scripture. You insert the right words and phrases to take what's on the page and make it your own request to God. Because it's his word. So find a partner. Here's what's going to happen. You're gonna, the, the band is probably going to play some background music. You're gonna, we're going to take three or four minutes for you to Together with a partner, pray Psalm 96. Just find some pieces of it that connect with your heart and offer them up to God as a prayer for your life, for your church, for your family, for our nation, for this world. And then Pastor Larry is going to come and lead us through a time of praying for some specific nations, some nations that Thompson Station is engaged with and working in. And there'll be opportunity if you're from another church for you to insert some nations maybe that you're connected to and that you're praying for and that you're working in. So glance down through Psalm 96, look at it, take a, take a minute or two to look through it, then get with a partner, and let's pray through Psalm 96, asking, the God, asking God to glorify His name in all the earth.